Happy 2020, New Hope Oahu. I am excited. I don't know about you, but there's something about 2020 that gets me thrilled. I, it, it, it brings out something in me. I, I've decided, though, that this year, and I don't know how you guys are, but I don't want to be too concerned about what's ahead of me in 2020. I'd rather focus on who is with me in 2020. Do you know what I mean? Isn't there a tendency where we could be fearful or there could be so many things coming at us at one time, 2020, what's it going to be? I don't want to worry about what it's going to be. I want to worry about who is with me in 2020, yeah? Um, Why? Because if God is for us, who can be against us, right? We don't need to fear. So we have a larger than usual crowd here tonight, and I have to imagine that some of you decided that this was going to be a year of studying your Bible a little bit more. So this is a great place to be. We want Wednesday nights to be a place where we can go deeper in the Word of God, where we can study our daily devotions and mine them for the gems that they have. I don't know if you guys are anything like me. Um, I don't make New Year's resolutions. Are you guys New Year's resolutions people? Anybody making? No, lots of no's in here. I like it. I like it. But what I do ask God for every year is a word. I say, God, what's the word for the year that you would have me focus on, right? So when my kids were young... I focused, uh, he gave me the word patience, right? You got little kids, and don't you hate that word, you know, patience, because you know there's going to be many times that God is going to cause you to need to be patient, right? Other times he gave me words like pruning. It's going to be a pruning season. When I was out trying to teach, trying to do too many different things, the Lord's like, no, this year is your year to prune back on everything. Yeah, recently, for two years in a row, guys, two years in a row, he gave me the word capacity capacity and that was because I was going to school I still had my family and I was being stretched like a rubber band that was just about ready to snap the first year and then he had to give it to me again the second year because I really wasn't ready the first year for that sort of stretching so he said again Stephanie I'm going to be working on your capacity So this year, he gave me a new word, and I'm super excited about it because it's finally a word that I like. Like, you know, don't give me patience again. Don't give me, don't give me uh, capacity again, please. But he gave me this word from Psalm 92, and it's this, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. Get this out for an old lady like me. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. So that's my word, flourish for the year. Because there's times where you've done the stuff, you know the word, you do, and then there's just time to just flourish. To be where he's called you to be, whatever that looks like, wherever that is, and just flourish there. So tonight, as you guys are sitting here thinking, I want you to be meditating on the word that God has given you for this year. Because each one of us has a word. Each one of us in this room has a calling. We are called to follow Jesus, right? To make him Lord of our lives. But living that calling out is going to look different for each one of us. So tonight, I want to talk about how we get from the cares of this life, because there are many, to the calling that God has for us. So I want to open up the Word of God. I hope you guys will bring your Bibles to Wednesday night, whether it's your phone. I like. Look, I brought my big, heavy-duty Bible tonight because I want the weightiness of this. Yeah, I want it tonight. I wanted to feel the weight of this Word. And we're going to open up and look at a man who had some issues come up in his life. Some something, some serious, drastic issues. A man who was given a clear dream of what God was calling him to, and yet seeing the fruition of that dream was going to come 
at a high price. And it would be a much harder road than he probably expected at first. Anybody got any idea who this is? This is Joseph. And, and I wonder if Joseph thought he was on the, the fast track to success, right? Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And let's take a look at the life of this dreamer. Now, I'm sure most of you know this story, but I want us to think about a couple of things. Joseph was the favored son of his father. It says this in Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born in his old age, and I will add to his favorite wife, Rachel, and he made an ornate robe for him. Now I wonder if Joseph got this robe from his father and thought, this is my ticket to luxury, right? This is my ticket to ease and luxury. Because many scholars believe that this robe was meant to be a sign to everyone else that Joseph wasn't going to have to work as hard as the rest of his brothers. Because you didn't give fancy ornate robes to those who were going out tending the sheep, right? When his brother saw, everybody say saw. Saw. See, this is the thing about favoritism. Everybody can see it. You're not hiding anything from anybody. That their father loved him more than any of them. They hated him and couldn't speak a kind word to him. Joseph came from what we would call a dysfunctional family. Yeah? He came from a blended family. His father had 12 sons with four different women. So if you come from a messed up, jacked up home, take heart because you are not alone, okay? God can use you anyway. Look at your neighbor and say, God can still use you. And now look at your other neighbor and say, God's going to use you. He is going to use you. So several years ago, there was a, uh, a famous book written by Victor and Mildred Gertzel called Cradles of Eminence. And they examine the backgrounds of really famous people, right? People like Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, people like Gandhi and Einstein and Freud. And among the things that they studied were how these famous folks grew up. And what they found was really interesting about the whole thing is they discovered that three quarters of the children endured poverty or broken homes or were raised by parents who rejected them or who were over possessive, so there's still hope for my kids in there, or dominating, right? <laughs> Nearly all the writers, and if you're a writer, I just bless you in the name of Jesus, but 74 out of 85 writers of fiction and drama, and 16 out of 20 poets came from homes where they experienced tense psychological drama which means mom and dad were out scrapping in the driveway, right? Drinking too much and beating each other up. They came from families like this. Over a quarter of these great people suffered from physical handicaps, blindness, deafness, crippled limbs. I wonder how many times we get it wrong when we look at a successful person and believe that their success came because they only had good things happen to them. Perhaps if we allow it to, some of the bad things that happen to us can shape us for the good. So let's read in Genesis 37, 5, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I had. We were out binding sheaves of grain. Now you can imagine this, right? And, and, and you think of this, we think of our millennials a little bit like this too. You know, he didn't know any better. He wasn't trying to be malicious. He had this dream. We're out binding sheaves of grain, binding up that wheat in the field when suddenly my sheep rose up straight and stood upward while all your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to it. Over the years, I have mentored college students, and oftentimes, oftentimes they come to me and they're like, Auntie Steph, 
I sense this great call on my life. Like it is super big. Like God has shown me in my dreams and, and people have prophesied over me that I'm going to preach to the nations. And I'm always like, wow. And, and I believe it. I believe that they've been given this dream. But then I ask them this question. Are you ready for the preparation that you're going to have to go through to achieve this great dream that God has given you? And they always are like, oh, yeah. But I don't think they have a clue. I don't think they have a clue what awaits them. The dream, just like Joseph, sounds so good. Everybody's bowing down to me. Not only this, but the sun and the moon and the stars. Everyone's bowing to me. But I don't think he had a clue what that was going to cost him. Joseph had no idea what he was getting into when he told his brothers about that dream or when he brought a bad report about his brothers to his father. The Bible says this. So before he, Joseph gets the, gets the robe, right? He goes out, kind of spies out the brothers, sees that they're doing some naughty stuff, goes back and tells daddy, right? Then they go back, the, the brothers are out doing the same thing again. Joseph comes riding up. He's got his robe on. He's ready there. He's, he's overseeing now. He's going to oversee these brothers. But the brothers see him coming from afar. And he, they say this, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into a pit and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see, and I want you guys to listen to this, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Guys, can we just learn one thing here? There will be those that desire to kill your dreams, yeah? There will be those that hope that you never do achieve that dream that you shared. I, I can remember sharing my dream of becoming a pastor with a person here. I, I, I was just excited and thrilled about it. And uh, they used to go to this church. They don't come here anymore. And uh, I remember they looked right at me and said, you're going to the wrong church. Wayne will never make you a pastor. He doesn't even believe in women pastors. And I remember my heart was crushed, and I was like, why did I even say anything? Why did I even tell her that dream? I was so devastated. I remember asking God, did I get it wrong? Am I, am I in the wrong place? Am I not supposed to be here? Listen, guys, had I believed that person and not believed what God had been showing me, what God had been saying to me, what God had been speaking to my heart, I would have left too soon, and I would be missing seeing all of your beautiful faces. And I would have missed the calling that God had for me because one person said, he'll never do it. You can never do that. You can never write that album. You can never write that book. You, no, yes, you can. Because he that is with you will see you through. He that is with you will make sure that you do. But the question is, are you willing to pay the price? So back to the brothers. They rip that robe off of him and they throw him, bam, right into a pit. Their rage against him was so strong. Their hatred was so deep. Their dysfunction was so radical that they wanted to kill him, kill his dreams, strip him of his authority. But instead, they decided to sell him into slavery. Now, I can't imagine how Joseph felt. One day you're having dreams that everyone is bowing down to you. And the next minute you find yourself sitting naked in a pit. And how many of us would ask ourselves, really, God, this is how you're like, seriously? This is what I want us to do. This is a point that you can write in your notes tonight. When we find ourselves in terrible circumstances, when we find ourselves in the depths of the pit, we must learn to trust God and not our circumstances. We've got to see our way out of that pit by trusting him and not our circumstances. Joseph found himself time and time again in some gnarly circumstances. I wonder what Joseph was thinking as he sat in that pit, stripped of his title of favorite son. The summer of uh, 
2015 marks a really hard season in my life. And, and it took me totally by surprise. It was a fun 2015. Everything was so exciting. Um, we had just had, we were on a backpacking trip. I know you, some of the women are looking at me like, fun, backpacking? But it was. We, we were carrying 50-pound packs on our back, and we were on the John Muir Trail. And we had done this for our daughter as sort of a rite of passage because she would be going away to college that next uh, fall, and we thought, well, if she can survive, you know, 10 miles a day on the John Muir tra Trail, ca carrying a 50-pound bag, then she probably is going to be okay at college. And as we're on, you know, you do 10 miles a day, so everybody kind of gets spread out along the trail, and I was walking by myself, and, and I hear this singing. And the girls are singing these worship songs. And I'm trying to catch them. I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. Why did she singing? She's happy. She's singing. And I'm trying to catch. And I hear the Lord just stop me in my tracks. And he says, Stephanie, it's time for you to let your daughter go. She's ready. She's equipped. And now it's time for you to let her go. And I realized at that moment that those apron strings had been tied to my daughter and I needed to be released and I had to trust. He said this to me, give me, give me, give her to me, give her to me. And it was as though my identity as a mom had sort of been taken away from me because she isn't going to need me anymore. Not in that capacity, right? Not as the authoritarian figure of a mom who says, you can't do this, you can do this, no more. Our relationship was going to change, and there was also going to be one less person sitting at my table that fall. And so it was kind of already a sad time for me, because I love my daughter. We're super close. But at that moment, I could start thinking and focusing on the dreams that God had for me, right? So there's something excited about it, right? I had raised my kids, and now God's saying, okay, it's time for you. Go to college. Do the things that you wanted to do. And so I was totally excited about the future, for the past few years before that, I had been going to this Christian concert. And I remember standing, it was a, like 60,000 people at this concert, and I was standing on the railing, and I was singing that song, Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. I just want to caution you. <laughs> when you sing that song with all your heart, and you actually mean it, there's a fair chance that God's going to take you up on it someday. Just like he took it up with me. I was singing that song. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail, right? And there I find you in the mystery. In oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I won't sing because that would make you all run away. Anyway, Pastor Marsha had just made Ross and I prayer team leaders, right? So we're prayer team leaders. My life is going, everything exciting. And then, bam, my husband gets the telephone call. And the telephone call was, thank you for your 30 years of service with this company, but your services are no longer required. Now, I got to tell you that, that that absolutely shocked us. Ross had been given sort of an outline of what the te next 10 years was going to look like. Like God was like, you know, I want you to start this little business and I want you to take people who normally wouldn't be able to get jobs. And God had been talking to Ross, but that was our 10-year plan. That was a plan that we were going to do in 10 years. And all of a sudden, God said, oh, no, your 10-year plan is my one-year plan. And the following year... Ross lost his job. And we found ourselves in that pit of despair. I don't know if any of you have had your spouse stripped of their identity, but his identity as the vice president of that company was taken from him. And he questioned 30 years, 30 years. I gave 30 years of my life to those people. For what? For this? to be stripped down to nothing, to not have anything for those 30 years to show for the hours that I spent away from home, for the hours that I spent missing Christmas, missing New Year. What did I do? I don't know if you've ever seen anybody in that state, but it's a really hard state 
to be in. And many men, that that happened, she would buy a motorcycle, get a girlfriend, and just sail off into the sunset, right? But not my husband. Thank you, Jesus. See, our family, when our kids were little teeny, my husband used to take them out surfing. And he would paddle them out. He would get on the board and he would paddle on his stomach. They would be on the front of the board. They would be holding on to his head for balance, right? And as they hit the water, he always taught them, raise up your hands and daddy will pull you up back onto the surfboard. When you hit, don't worry, just put your hands straight up in the air. And for one whole year, you guys, we sat in the pit and we lifted up our hands and we said, Jesus, Jesus, if you don't pull us up out of these crashing waves that were coming again and again and again, we will surely die. We will not make it through this. I still blame Pastor Marsha for a lot of that. <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah. Funny thing, I remember Pastor Wayne telling us before all this happened, years before, reminding everyone that just because you're making a lot of money today doesn't mean you'll be making a lot of money next week. And you need to plan for that. You need to have six months ready just in case because you never know. And we had tried. We'd been working really hard to pay down our mortgage and to not have debt. But we weren't prepared for this. How are our kids going to go to college, finish their college, right? Was I going to have to drop out of school? Was my pastor dream out the window? Was I never? It was a really hard year. And Ross woke up at 4 a.m. every single morning and prayed for an entire year. And we just sat there and we held our breath. And it's funny to look at it now because I think God was saying to me, Stephanie, if you're going to tell people that Jesus is all they need, then you better know what it feels like when Jesus is all you've got. Amen. Yeah. Like, if you're going to be up there and authentically preach this to people, then guess what, Stephanie? You're going to have to go through some stuff, too, that you're not going to like. Your comfy life strip, your identity strip. No one called us, guys. No one called us. No friends from that business called us. And it was so silent that it was eerily silent because his phone would ring 10, 15. You know, he's always on his phone, always on his phone. And then all of a sudden, silence, like crickets. All right. Now, Joseph, we're told, is sold to Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials. He was the captain of the guard. Now, listen to this. Chapter 39, verse 2, because it holds a really important key for us. Read it with me. Can you? Ready, go. Yeah, great. The Lord was with Joseph. Hold on right there. Say that again. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Now listen, when the Lord is with us, we prosper. It doesn't matter if we're in the pit or we're in the palace. God will cause us to prosper. And people will be able to see that the Lord is with us. Look at what verse 3 says now. Now remember, Joseph was sold as a slave. He was a slave. But when the master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his entire household. He entrusted everything to his care. The Bible says in verse 5, from the time that he put him in charge of his household and everything he owned, check this out, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. I just got to say that again. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. Joseph, the slave who was sold into slavery. God still blessed him in that place. Now, I want you to notice something. Joseph is being trained. He is not the spoiled son who gets to check up and tell on his brothers. He's not daddy's little boy anymore. Joseph has been stripped of his robe of many colors. His identity as the favored son is gone. And now he's called to put on a servant's apron. Joseph, Joseph's dream did not come true 
by being placed in a fancy school or staying in his father's house. It came true when he was forced to leave every comfort that he had and go and serve somebody. God knows exactly what we need to go through to get us from the pit to the palace. But are we willing to pay that price? Okay, the next thing we see is Joseph being wrongly accused. Okay, Joseph's life is going to take a change again for the seeming worse. Joseph now is going to have to decide. Am I going to let this situation make me bitter? Or am I going to allow it to make me better? We always have a choice. God gives us that choice. It's up to us to decide. So Potiphar has his wife. And she is hot. Men, can I just hear an amen? I mean, guaranteed, she is the Beyonce of her day. And she has her eyes set on Joseph. And I have to imagine that this was very difficult for this young man. Here is this gorgeous woman coming on to him. And I'm sure they must have been in some kind of close proximity for her to be able to seize him by his cloak. There's another big lesson for us here. The devil knows exactly what kind of bait to put on the hook that he has for you. Whatever it is. Could be a beautiful woman. What is your your weakness? Is it a drug? Is it a woman? What is it? Every single one of us has a different weakness. And the enemy knows just the right bait to put on it. Check this out. Getting Joseph to lay with Potiphar's wife would have given him total access to destroy not only Joseph and his entire family, but the whole nation of Israel would have gone down for this one decision if Joseph had made that decision. But see, Joseph was a man of integrity. And Joseph learned how to do something. When you're faced with that temptation, when it's right up in your business and it's all there for the offering, there's only one thing to do. Run! Can I get amen? Run! Don't look at it. Don't entertain it. Don't go, wow, that she is hot. Don't, don't even think it for a minute. Don't allow it into your brain. Remember this. Eve looked at the apple and she saw that it was delightful to look at and pleasing to the stomach. Wait, I said that wrong, and it's a really powerful statement. It was pleasing to the eye. That's what it is. She looked at that apple, and it was pleasing to the eye and good to eat. There are many things that are pleasant for us to look at, and that will satisfy an appetite that we have for it. But they will destroy us. So let's let God be the only thing that satisfies. If God is that one thing that satisfies, let it be him. Okay, so now Joseph has another challenge, and that is he's going to go and face prison. It's because the enemy schemes are gone, right? Joseph didn't take the bait. He ran. He ran. Please get that in your head. Run. But now he's trying a new tactic. He's going to try betrayal and false accusations against him. Have you ever been falsely accused of anything? Potiphar's wife lies about what happens and wrongly accuses him. And the next thing we know, he's off to prison. (laughs) And first, he's got the robe and he's feeling good. But then he's in the pit and then he gets to one of the palaces and everything's looking pretty good. But now he finds himself in the prison? I mean, wouldn't you think that he might just say, what's the use? Like, I've tried. Like, really, I've tried. I've done my best. I stood up to that challenge, and it winds me up in prison. But again, he had a choice. Was his circumstance going to make him better, or was it going to make him bitter? And we probably all would understand and say, yeah, bad luck, Joseph. Sucks to be you, you know. I mean, maybe that dream was just some bad tabouli. Maybe there was nothing, you know, it was just, it, it, it. I feel like I have a word for someone and it is God is not done with you yet. Don't give up. 
on what it is that he's called you to. Don't let your circumstances and what you're seeing in front of you right now cancel out what God will do in the future. Whether you're in the pit or whether you're in the prison or whether you're in the palace, don't allow your circumstances. Again, someone specific. And if it is you, will you please see me after because I want to pray for you. Look at Joseph, even in the prison, the Bible says, Joseph's master took him to the palace where the king's prisoners were confined. But, everybody say but. But while Joseph was there in prison, even there, the Lord was with him. He showed kindness and gratitude, and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. He allowed him to interrupt Sorry, he, he, he allowed Joseph to interpret the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer. Do you remember that? And do you remember he didn't take any credit? He said, God is the one who interprets dreams. I don't do it. It's God. He gave all the glory and the credit back to God. He interpreted their dreams absolutely correctly. The baker gets the axe. The cup baker goes back and says, I promise I will remember you. I will tell Pharaoh about you. What happens? Two more years. Two more years. Joseph sits in prison. He was forgotten in the prison. And again, we would wonder, what the heck, God? Did I not? Did I not listen to you here? Did I not follow you? Have I not learned enough? Have I not put on my servant's apron? Have I not served you enough? My husband and I had to wait three years for the thing that God had for us, for the dream that God had for us. Three years. First year, tears, crying. Which way is up? I don't know. Being in the great washing machine of the Lord. The next year, wrongly accused. Bad things happening. Wave after wave after wave of disappointment. Third year, God says, this is what I have for you. And see, there's times where God is getting things in order that wouldn't have been there right away, right? For us, it was our business. It wasn't ready for us three years ago. It took three years for God to put the people in the right place to get us to where he needed us to be. But we had to be willing. We had to be okay with the pain. We had to be okay with, we don't know. People would say, what are you guys doing? We're like, we don't know. We don't know. Well, you got to go look for a job. Well, every time we look for a job, the door slams shut, slams shut, slams shut every single time because God had something amazing waiting for us. So listen, you guys know the story, right? Pharaoh has a dream. There's going to be a famine in the land. They, he doesn't know that at the time. He has, finally, he is remembered. Joseph is remembered in that old dusty prison cell. The cupbearer remembers him, brings him up. He interprets the dream. They know there's going to be a famine. And there's only one challenge left for Joseph. And that is, will you be able to forgive, right? Because now the brothers know there's a famine. The father sends them to Egypt, right? The brothers, can you imagine the the brothers? Like they, I I would have to imagine when they told the dad that Joseph was dead, I think they must have believed it themselves on some level. Like there's no way that he could be alive. And yet Joseph was very much alive. And there he was. And can you imagine Joseph as he sees the ones who had tried to kill him, who literally probably, he knew they wanted to kill him. And they're there and they need something from him. And now those ones that tormented him and tortured him were needing something from him. And he has a choice right there. Is he going to forgive them? And yeah, he did kind of torture them slightly a little bit before, but, but he did. He was able to forgive. Why? Because now he understood what the dream meant. See, when he was young, he didn't understand what it meant. He was just happy. He was so puffed up with himself that everybody was going to be bowing to him. But he didn't understand until now when he saw his brothers there, what God was really doing in all of that. 
the final product of Joseph's life as we see his sufferings did make him better. And he was able to forgive his brothers because his dream finally made sense to him. Joseph may have interpreted his dream wrongly when he was young, but now he interprets everything correctly. Does anybody have really good 2020 hindsight? My, my eyesight is getting worse and worse. The older I get, it's hard for me to read this book. But I'll tell you what, I do have 2020 hindsight. And I can see the goodness of God in my life looking back. So one more thing, God. God is a God of unlikely stories. As a matter of fact, if a story works out too easily, I tend not to trust them. So we know the story. Joseph finally chooses to reveal himself to his brothers after he tortures them for a little bit. And you can't really blame him for that, can you? He says in Genesis 50, 20, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me but God intended it for the good to accomplish what now is being done the saving of many lives Joseph recognized in the end that his dream wasn't about people bowing down to him it was about God saving his nation that his dream was so much bigger than him being served or having others bow down to him. It was actually about God. So let me ask you a question tonight. I'm going to end with this, guys. What hard place is God preparing you in right now that he will use later to save many lives? Romans 8, 28 says, And we know this, that all things, everybody say all things, all things work together for the good, right? Who love God and are called according to his purposes. So what we want to do every night, we want to, at Wednesday nights, we want to take time and we want to pray. I'm sorry I ran a little bit late, so maybe this will be shorter than I had hoped. Because that was a big chunk of Joseph, yeah? Sorry about that. That was big. But tonight I just want to pray. And if any of you feel like you're in a pit and you can't get out, I would love to pray for you. If any of you feel maybe like Joseph's brothers, where you're going to stand before the one that you hurt, the one that you tried to kill, and you feel too much shame to be able to stand before him, I want to pray for you. If any of you have a dream and it's bigger than you think you could ever accomplish on your own, I want to pray for you because it is going to take something from you. It is going to cost you something to achieve that dream. So if any of those things that I just said is you, would you please stand up? I, I literally want to pray for you. No shame. No shame. Just stand up. Good. Thank you, God. Pastor John, Pastor Cindy, will you come up and pray as well, please? We just want to speak life over you. We want to speak life into those dry places. We want to speak life into that place where it feels like there is no hope, but we know that our God is faithful and that he can do it. If you need to put your arms up and say, Jesus, pull me out of these waves. The waves are overwhelming me. Lift up your arms because he is here. And he will reach down and pull you up out of that pit. God's going to give you a word for this year right now. Both for those who are standing and those who are sitting. Yes. God. I want you to just ask. Heavenly Father, what's my word for 2020? Yes. Just close your eyes right now. Yes. Say, Heavenly Father, what's my word for 2020? And let's just wait on the Lord right now. Yes, God.
just like Joseph received that word early on. He didn't really understand what it meant until later in his life. God, that word that you've just dropped into our spirit, we might not even understand what that means. But as you lead us through the year, in the highs and the lows, I know, God, that you're going to um, reveal that. It's going to make more sense. God, we just receive that right now, the plan that you have for our life in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We can trust you. Lord, with every, with every dream, God, with every burden, we trust you. Lord, even as we're halfway into this first month of the year, and I know some of us are like, wait, that already hasn't started how I expected. Yeah. Lord, we trust you. Lord, just as Pastor Steph spoke tonight, Lord, we can trust that you will work all things together for good, that you'll take it all, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the awful, and Lord, you'll build something beautiful. Because it's all about you and it's all for you. So, Father, we trust you. We trust you, Father God, that you're working beyond what we can see right now. And we have the joy to partner with you even in the places we can't see yet. We thank you. Your love for us is so great that you don't show us all at one time. We trust you, Father. We worship you tonight. And we praise your name as a church. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.